well, I guess I was aware of it, uh, but it really was all part of my background and my education. It came naturally, or the theories behind it came naturally. The actual design was somewhat more different from ones I'd done previously. It was a traditional house uh, where the main rooms, the main bedroom, the main living room was always on the front because it had to be presented to the public. Uh, it was usually an axial plan, typically overhang from Victorian days, uh, central corridor, rooms on either side, uh, and the main rooms, as I say, in the front, and the kitchen probably what, miles down the back, and no relation to the landscape, uh, you know, central path up the front, and rose beds on either side. Uh, it wasn't a, a, a total design in the sense that we had been taught. In those days, the council, in its wisdom, uh, felt that brick and tile was the proper way to go, uh, and the timber or asbestos, as it was all right in those days, uh, was not just not the proper way to live. But fortunately, on this side of Boundary Road, we could build it what we like. The flat roof was probably going to be a problem because uh, they had some aesthetic control, sadly, but in the event it wasn't. Well, I suppose one could be self-critical there because the initial response to the site wasn't as sympathetic as this house was. It was much more dramatic. Uh, and I was trying to create a house which was very much contemporary and which used contemporary materials, steel and concrete and glass, and <coughs> had some human expression, which was my big criteria, I suppose. Uh, so that it was very modern materials and the idea was to try and make a house which was human and friendly using those materials rather than reverting to tile, not sort of stone particularly, shingles and things like that which were easily related, one could relate to them but they weren't of the time. Uh, fortunately I think the house didn't go ahead, it was too expensive and uh, we came up with this design and it, it did revert to traditional materials to gain what I called human expression. Very driving force, because we had no money and it was a war service home loan. And the idea was to try and make the house appear psychologically as big as we could. And that's where we came up with various ideas to hopefully achieve that. No, that doesn't create the expansiveness, that created the, uh, the planning really uh, and that we could turn out, it was an ideal site because it faced north. So the rear garden could become the private space and it was the best prospect and aspect as it turned out. Mm. Uh, we turned our backs to the street so we, we, were, we both wanted privacy and we had north privacy in, in that garden. And that was why the site was so successful really, from our point of view. Yes, yes, yes. Well, we... Oh, where do we start? <laughs> the, the planning as such was, first that we had to have three major zones. And functionalism and planning were very strong to both our minds. The planning had to work. So we had a, a living zone, which was to the left of the main entrance, and we had a sleeping zone, which was to the right of the main entrance, and the so-called work zone, which was the kitchen, bathroom and things. So they were clearly defined, I think. Uh, yes, things take. We always intended to. The main footprint didn't change. Mm -hmm. the, the, the extended bedrooms were always intended to be where they were. Uh, <coughs> there was an open veranda uh, between the study and the sitting room. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we put the deck on, we didn't need it as such. And we took it into the sitting room so we had a bit more living space. That was really the only change. I put, did put a door on the study because, <laughs> because the idea was it was a free-flowing plan. That was the thinking of the time. And the rooms weren't little boxes with little doors cut in the walls into them. But the whole thing flowed. Uh, that created one of the reasons to create a feeling of space. And there were no actual doorways. They were just up openings to the ceiling. And the walls became planes within the overall volume, I suppose. Uh, that was the thinking, but of course 
whilst it was wonderful in many ways to live in, it was not necessarily acoustically private. So hence the door on the study. I think that I've always loved structure. And yet to see that the, the, the building is resolved structurally, you, you understand how it works. And my, many, I have a lot of criticism today of many of the houses we see. I just look at those things and how the hell does it stand up? What keep, what, it, it's not happy in me, it, it's restless. So if the structure is resolved, I feel there's far more chance of repose within the, the volume of the home. And so you can see it, you feel where the loads are, where the stresses are going. Oh, I think the, the Japanese feelings and architecture were strong influence, yes. yes. No, I've never been to Japan, sadly, but the whole attitude was, particularly of timber construction. Was... Well, I suppose when I finished my course, uh, one of the things, and I was a strong contemporary, hopeful architect, and strongly believed in all the theories of the time, uh, but I felt that the houses particularly were, were lacking something. Uh, there was no detail, there was no uh, little bit of human touches, and consequently I felt they were cold. Uh, and decoration had become a dirty word, largely because I think the, the the modern movement came about as a reaction to Victorianism and the high, huge amount of decoration, so the decoration became almost more important than the architecture in which it was based. Uh, so I wanted to add a little humanity, that was really as simple as that. Uh, the Melbourne School were very critical of it. Uh, but that was another theory of mine, which we'd been taught, that one should be truthful in the use of materials and you couldn't base an art on a falsehood. So that if you wanted a brick wall, you didn't build a timber wall and cover it in brick wallpaper. Or you didn't have, you know, laminate, which was laminate, and make it look like timber. So again, in the use of materials, one should use them honestly. And this is a bit pedantic, but if you had a brick wall and you wanted to put an opening in it, an arch was a logical way to put an opening in it. The materials formed a natural arch if they were handled properly. And that's all it was. It was surprisingly easy. I thought it would be terrible. It was surprisingly easy because uh, it was over, the relationship had been over quite a long period. It needed 12 months, I think, wasn't it? Yes, it, it was. Yeah. And uh, so, no, it, it, it was a wrench, obviously. Yes. Uh, what I was going to was far, far different from this in so many ways. Uh, but my children told me the time had come and they were right. No, it, it was a lot easier than I had expected because the house had become, for Pam and I, very much part of our lives. <laughs> probably probably yeah. somewhat too much so. Not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't mean that really. No, I, I think the house, I often felt the house in many ways was a background uh, to various forms of interior treatment. I must be careful not to say decoration. Uh, <laughs> uh, and obviously, and it reflects one's personalities a bit, I think. And Annalise's personality is different from mine. Uh, and she's been able to, I think, to, to make those changes. Uh, I wouldn't leave them like that, but th that's fair enough. I think the house can do it. It doesn't worry me at all. Yeah. I mean, there's more colour in it now than we had, but then I have to remember that we had some pretty violent colours in that sitting room ourselves from time to time. You did. You took them all down. Yes, but we you took them down. So we've, orange you know, walls. We, yes, and... yes. So that I think the house can take it. Oh, I think that'd have to be joy, wouldn't it? 
Russell <laughs> talks a lot about joy in architecture and, you know, I think that's the thing about his aesthetic. It's just so joyful. You know, everything about this house, the light, the way it integrates, the decoration, mm. you know, it's just filled with joy. And I think it's, in, you know, it's embedded with him and Pam and their family. And, you know, I sort of have a belief that, that you know, spaces have some sort of spirit. You know, they get embedded with... With you know history and what's happened in the past, and it, it just oozes this joy, you know. Yeah. So I think that's the thing about Russell's aesthetic. Everything's geared towards joy. If it's not going to be joyful, why do it, you know? <laughs> I, I have to butt in there. My students would love that mm -hmm. because I always I did talk about joy a lot to the students uh, to the extent that one of them went on a holiday at one stage and found a car with a number plate J O Y something and sent me a photograph of it. I think it's those moments where you turn the corner and then you see the wallpaper, you know, and then and then it's all restrained again and then you get a glimpse of the wallpaper at the end of the hall. You know, it's those moments, it's, it's that restraint and that's the thing that Russell does so beautifully. You know, everything about the house is restrained, so I think that's it. It's not it's not over the top and, and that's it's, mm. it's sort of innate, isn't it? You just get a feeling I where the know, fine line do. is. <laughs> you do, you know, as a designer I know myself, yeah. but I think it's just that feeling that there's just mm. enough and, you know, not too much. I think that's what it is. It's yeah, it's just these moments that because of the planning of the house too, it it unfolds as you move through the house. You know, that's what's also so beautiful. It's not walking in and it's all there at the at that moment, but you can get glimpses. So I think that's it, you know, these glimpses of joy and it's also the light and it's you know, it's it's seeing the the you know, nature coming in as well. So it's not just the decoration. It's it's almost like, you know, nature is becomes part of the decoration of the house as well. So it's that backdrop as well. Mm. Totally. Mm. Because literally, you know, it's so beautifully oriented, you know, facing north, as Russell said, that what happens is you get all the easterly sun in the morning, you know, in the bedroom and in the kitchen and when you're having your breakfast. And then it moves around during the day. So no matter where you are in the house during the day, you've got the light. It's almost like follows the light. It's just beautiful. Mm? <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I think it's, one would have to admit, it's very important because it was a major part of my life was spent here and the happiest part of my life, you know, with a, a, a wonderful marriage and wonderful children and superb dogs <laughs> <laughs> and opportunities for me to carry out what few hobbies I had, which was mainly playing with the house and carpentering and bricklaying in the garden and there's so much we put into it. Uh, that it's wonderful to think it's all understood and loved. And I, that's so true. Yeah. Well, I feel very privileged that I was the one that got to yeah. look after it for <laughs> Thank you. Thank God you did. <laughs> Oh, I think mostly it's the integration of the site and the architecture and the interior. It's this holistic view that Russell has. You know, you can see just behind me how the house just opens up into the landscape. So I think, you know, it's, it's having that one idea and being so committed to it and pushing it through right through to the joinery and, you know, absolutely everything that makes it so extraordinary. And obviously, you know, his use of decoration, being an interior designer, you know, it's fairly rare in houses of this era. So, you know, his decorations, it's restrained, but it's just so inspired. So I adore that. Oh, what else can I say? The, you know, his truthfulness in materials, the fact that the house is, it's just so warm and, you know, it's just such a beautiful place to live. It's like, it's like living in the bush, really. Well, again, I think it's that. It's like living in nature. We live on this creek and, you know, the house just opens up. It's like being in a tree house, really, you know, when you look out the window. Um, it's just that extraordinary, you know, of being almost, yeah, at peace, at connected to nature. It's, I can't really describe it. It's so, it's so filled with joy, you know. The sun comes in in different locations at different times of the year and, and the beautiful oak tree, you know, that was a housewarming present to Russell and Pam, you know, 50, what, seven years ago. You know, that tree just, the, the, you know, the, I suppose the changes of seasons, it's like you're very much, you know, really connected to nature. So it's beautiful. And, and having my daughter in the house, you know, the house is so beautifully designed, this L shape that 
you know, with all the glazing that no matter where I am in the house, even if I'm doing my own thing, I can still see my daughter. So there's this fantastic idea that we can connect and still see each other visually, but we're not living on top of each other. Not like these open plan spaces today where everything's all happening, you know, at once. It's, 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 it's beautiful. I actually fell in love with this particular house. Um, in 1996, I um, worked on an exhibition for Sydney Living Museums um, that was the Historic Houses Trust. And it was an exhibition of all the Sulman Award winning buildings to date. And I come from Melbourne, so I knew lots and lots about you know, Melbourne architecture, but very little about Sydney architecture. And um, we, I was on a, a research panel and we all got divvied up, you know, different buildings to research and it just so happened that I, this was one of them. And I absolutely fell in love with that whole idea of the siting and over the creek and, and Russell's use of decoration. Um, it it was, became my dream house, it's extraordinary. And Russell became sort of like my mentor. So yes, yeah, so this house has been really, you know, in my psyche since 1996, it's, it's extraordinary. When I arrived at the front door and Russell was here, you know, I brought my mother as well with me and I just, I, I could not believe it, like, but I can honestly say that the minute arriving at the front door, I just knew that I was going to live in this house. It was, it was unbelievable, you know, so yes, all I can say is it was an extraordinary, you know, for Russell and for me, because it was just such a perfect fit, you know, for my furniture, for my lifestyle, you know, everything, the aesthetic that I adore, you know, we, Russell and I have a lot of similarities in that. So yeah, to sort of, you know, buy your dream house, designed by, you know, I suppose my architectural mentor was extraordinary. And then to have this amazing relationship now that I have with Russell, it's, you know, it's, it's really too good to be true, you know, <laughs> better than winning lotto, I tell you. Well, look, when I bought the house, I said that to Russell. I said, you know, this house is just too exquisite and too extraordinary for me to keep, you know, all to myself. So I think I knew from the very minute that I bought it that I was actually going to open it to the public. So for the four and a half years I've been here, I've opened it, you know, numerous times to Sydney Living Museums for a Sydney Open, to lots of institutions like, you know, um, the AAA, the Australian Architecture Association institutions, you know, universities, I bring my own students here. I'm, I'm really passionate, I think, about educating people about the, the importance of these houses. And, you know, this is a very modest house by today's, you know, um, sizes that most people build their houses. And as an interior designer, you know, I can just see, you know, there's, we just don't have enough resources, you know, materials, land, and this house embodies everything that we really should be doing. You know, a lot of these ideas have sort of been lost. So I'm really passionate about that. Um, and then I suppose the big thing is that, um, that Russell and I managed to get it listed on the, um, the New South Wales Heritage Register last year. And that was, you know, that was extraordinary. We worked on the nomination together and, and that was very important for me to make sure that no matter what happens in the future, you know, this house is protected as much as possible. Totally, because you can talk about this and you can tell them we need to, you know, think smaller, we need to be clever about how we design spaces to make the most of it. You know, built-in joinery just looking in this room around me and, and you know, psychologically opening spaces up by using glazing and things. But, but yeah, you can talk about as much as, you know, you want, but when they come and they see it, it's almost like an aha moment. I can tell you they just go, oh my God, now I get it. You know, they can just see how something that's very modest it really feels like, you know, a TARDIS. People call this the sort of, you know, <laughs> the, the big little house because it just, it really expands. You know, when you're in the space, it feels so much bigger than it is. And yes, and just that limited palette of materials and not having to have, you know, every single material that happens to be available today in the one space, you know, is, is just beautiful. So yes, they see it. So it's an extraordinary teaching device as well. People walk in and sort of, you know, say to me, God, it looks like you've been here for 20 years. And it does, you know, obviously I'd been collecting mid-century furniture for probably 15 or more years. It just happens to be the aesthetic that, you know, I like and I admire. And, um, and so pretty much I just move my furniture in and it, it's extraordinary, you know, um, and all my favourite colours in the world, you know, the wallpapers are green and red, you know, the Marameco fabric's red. It, it was just too perfect. So yes, it was, you know, meant to be, what can we say? Very little, yes, very little. Um, 
All I've really done is I painted a wall in the bedroom um, black. Um, I did that because I inherited Russell's um, Victorian-esque bedhead, um, which wasn't really my style and it wasn't really, you know, didn't fit with the rest of my furniture. But, you know, I suppose being the preservationist that I am and, and I love the continuity in houses. I love houses telling stories. And so I really wanted to retain as much as possible from Russell and his family. Um, and it was Pamela's family. So um, by painting the wall black, it all worked, you know, beautifully. So that's really the only decorative thing. Um, and then the only thing I've done in, in relation to actually um, reinstating something is there are some louvers in the master bedroom and I decided to reinstate them. Russell had had them originally there but they weren't functioning so um, so Russell and I and another gentleman who's a um, furniture designer and he got Glenn Merkett involved and there are quite a few people involved and anyway we came up with a new system and I got some new louvers made and we stained them and it's beautiful. It was sort of the only thing in the house that wasn't working the way it was meant to and it's just gorgeous and I think Russell's really happy now too.